Okay, it's five after, so I think we can get started. Um, welcome everybody. This is the Telcom user group uh, meeting. Uh, we meet on the first Monday of every single month at 1500 UTC. Um, that was decided after a recent poll, we used to flip back and forth, uh, but now we're just meeting at 1500 UTC. Um, if uh, you're joining today and you're new, please feel free to add your or actually everyone, please feel free to add your name to the meeting notes uh, so we can keep a record of who has been here. So we don't have a ton on the agenda today. Uh, we're gonna have a presentation um, from the great folks at Eno. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the what's going on in the CNF working group to keep this group up to date. But before we jump into that, is there anything that anyone else would like to add to the agenda? Okay. Uh, so we want, uh, it's more like a question uh, than a request to the addition to the agenda. Do, don't you want to discuss a bit uh, how to continue with the uh, network orchestration group? What was started or discussed in the last meeting? We had some discussions on Slack, but I'm not really sure how to continue with that. Um, yeah, we, we could add that to agenda, maybe give a five minute uh, update on uh, uh, not, a, not too much has been done, but uh, um, we can add that to the agenda. Yeah, I'm more interested in how how to continue. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, it's a little bit on me right now. I, there's one task I need to do. But anyway, let, let's add that to the agenda and discuss. Good idea. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Um, is there anything anyone else would like to add? Okay. Um, it seems I forgot to uh, copy up the uh, events. So just as an FYI um, for people that are interested, uh, the CNF working group meets uh, weekly on Mondays. Uh, the Etsy plug test is now done. Um, the Kubernetes on Edge event, um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, running Kubernetes on the Edge, is going to be Monday, May 3rd. The CFP is now closed, and I think there's a lot of really exciting talks. Um, so register for that now and find out more. Um, and also, that's going to lead into KubeCon called NativeCon uh, Virtual Europe 2021, and that's the first week of May. Um, so there's links for all of that in the meeting notes. Uh, now with that, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to the folks that, you know, to give a little intro to their project. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. And then I saw Luke on the call earlier. Hello. Am I audible? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. So let me share and then we can start. Hope I'm sharing. Yep. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Thanks. So hello everyone, myself Alok. Uh, I've been working with Ericsson, part of this uh, external network orchestration. We started up as a study uh, within within our team, working on the Kubernetes network orchestration and how we can actually fill in the gaps which we have currently in the Kubernetes default networking model. And, how we can make it more dynamic and can be orchestrated on demand. So we started up as a study. Now we are in a phase that we've been running a um, proof of concept and have the intention or the ambition to make it open source so that we can basically the whole community can leverage it and we, we get a quick feedbacks and, and we can expand as required. So 
this is a quick walkthrough about uh, the proposal, which I think I shared it with Bill a couple of weeks ago, and we decided to bring it up here in this forum with the uh, with a group of people and, and collect the feedback. How are we targeting the uh, right thing, or is it something which doesn't solve purpose or won't add value to the community? So a bit of a background here to begin with. As we all know, the standard Kubernetes networking model that relies on the single netted interface and that's what Tal also mentioned in one of his uh, slide deck, right? So, and while with that single netted interface, when working with the interworking uh, external networks, so it doesn't really, or doesn't always provide the proper network separation. And above all, its implementation through the Linux kernel IP stack mechanism doesn't fulfill the performance requirements which many of the telco network functions have been looking for. So as a workaround or basically as a solution, so to say, there is an introduction of the special network attachments or what we call the secondary network attachments through Multis or there are other solutions like NSM basically to, to overcome these telco specific limitations. So, so basically the, the secondary uh, network attachment uh, was introduced in Kubernetes to, to let's say the so far evaluated Multis to overcome these limitations, which allows the pod direct L2 attachments to provide the multiple external networks for providing the network separation and also to support uh, those telco specific protocols and basically to provide the choice of different network attachments like the kernel interface or the word IO devices, SRIOV virtual function devices. So it's a, it's a wide spectrum uh, to provide it or to facilitate the performance requirements, including the high throughput user plane network functions. And so far these uh, these network isolation are being achieved through this pre-configured static fabric orchestration. And it's not in general very much dynamic. So we cannot basically uh, automatize uh, the with the life cycle of the network function. So we basically, when we deploy a network service or a network function, we basically rely upon the pre-configured, those static tenant networks, uh, which are being deployed during the cluster installation time, let's say. So that we identified as a, as a gap and how we can actually uh, automate that so that we can basically make it more dynamic and can be created on demand when we when we basically deploy a network function. So the 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 Kubernetes external network orchestration, how we've been doing it today uh, in both NFV infrastructure based deployments and in, in case of bare metal CAS based deployments. So there are a couple of steps in, in the NFVI based uh, infrastructure deployments. So it's a it's a provider network that we create or that we orchestrate in, in, in FEI-based deployments. It's a multi-segment network, right? So it consists of VLAN and VLAN, VXLAN segments. And then the L2 gateway connections are being created uh, using the OpenStack API, right? To bridge the VLAN and the VXLAN on the hardware beat. And then we basically spun up the worker VMs uh, with the trunk uh, VNIC, right? And then we associate it with the, with the trunk ports during the VM boot up. And then these external network connections are being then orchestrated as a sub ports to those trunk ports in, in the worker VM. 
by creating the subports in the provider network on in the open stack terms. In case of bare metal, it's fairly straightforward. We first provision the fabric through the fabric specific API as a L2 network. And then the VLAN IDs are being configured on the fabric uh, MLAG interface facing the host computes and on the MLAGs connected to the gate, BC gateway. And just to note in both the cases, the network attachment or the association on the gateway, which is uh, your created VLAN associated with the VRFs can be either orchestrated through NFVO in, in terms of MANU architecture and then, or it could be done through some scripts. And like I said, today it all been done manually. So we can do a question to ourselves, like why, if, if we have to configure such networks thousands of time, is it an ideal solution to follow those steps uh, one, by, one by one for, for these many uh, network configuration? I think it might not be the ideal solution. It's more error prone. It's a, it's a tedious task to do, even if it is through some uh, bash scripts or, or some, some, some scripts. Uh, so to solve it, uh, to make it uh, more automatized, we introduce the concept of operator uh, for doing that, or it's, it's basically the operator concept is there in the Kubernetes ecosystem. It's, it's quite uh, known and it's, it's a, there are lots and lots of efforts being done by other um, projects uh, to to basically handle how how we can handle the stateful applications or so basically here we what we are trying to uh, introduce is the external network operator to basically automate those network uh, orchestration the creation basic or the life cycle of those external networks so what let's let's go through the you know what exactly it's uh, and as i said it's a Kubernetes operator, which sits inside the Kubernetes cluster to automate those external network creations and the life cycle. It's a controller component uh, being deployed uh, as part of the Kubernetes cluster and it will be bound with the life cycle of the cluster. Uh, it is a fabric agnostic uh, or it follows the fabric agnostic uh, architecture which allows the adaptation to the multi-vendor fabric. And it, it follows the two facade architecture, one for the internal purpose, managing the custom resources, and one for managing the underneath fabric and for doing the fabric orchestration and external networks. So this is the overall <coughs> architecture of Eno and the the plugin api so if i start from top to bottom so we have this uh, northbound api uh, uh, which basically we through this api we are uh, collecting or feeding in the crds the custom resource definitions and then this fabric agnostic operator uh, it's the southbound of emo and then that basically has uh, the pluggable uh, CNI support, which supports various uh, fabrics. You let's call it Fabric A, Fabric B, or Neutron in case of OpenStack-based deployments. And to be a specific, uh, or to call a specific fabric, an OBS pitch. It's, it's a dummy fabric, which we are implementing it for our uh, POC basically. So we have various fabrics and for each fabric, we have a corresponding fabric plug plugin to basically orchestrate that fabric. And basically, Eno has the this dotted line. 
splits the Eno between two as two facades. The, the above one basically handles or manages the uh, custom resources, which we will discuss in detail in coming slides. And the, the below one is for the external uh, fabric orchestration and the external network creation and management of those external networks basically. And then, as I said, we, we are working on a proof of concept. So this OVS bridge, which we are using it as a dummy fabric for our realization of the, as a fabric and then having OVS plugin to basically orchestrate that fabric. So that's the overall architecture we have for Eno. Any questions so far from anyone? Okay. Um, yes, maybe one yeah. quick question. Um, yeah. So uh, the the dotted line here that uh, separates the internal versus the external is the, the idea, as I understand it here, is that these plugins are not just for orchestrating external networks, but really to connect them to containers running in Kubernetes, right? So even though it's not CNI, for example, OVS, the idea is that you will get this L2 network to your pods, am I correct? Right, so you will be getting your, exactly. So the L2 connections directly to, to your pods so that it can be. Um, so those, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dimitris. Yeah. Um, so, so those, uh, so, those uh, so the question is that using that in OBS plugin, plugin and Eudor plugin and all of that, there's those color, color, colorful boxes, boxes that we have here, right? So, um, so you know, actually, uh, of two parts. parts. The, the first part is the you know controller, um, that actually handles all the internal cluster operation, and uh, the, the second part is the is the is the fabric plugin. This fabric plugin will also run as a pod or as or as a deployment inside Kubernetes cluster, cluster and uh, we'll, we'll actually have, have a, a Northbound North API and a Southbound API. API. And the Northbound North API will actually take uh, instructions from the Eno controller and uh, to create some domains, domains or whatever. And uh, the Southbound API will directly uh, configure the fabric which uh, locates outside of the, of the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, is, is this clear? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was clear, but you're uh, uh, you have a lot of echo in your sound. It was it was kind of hard to understand, but I, I think I got my answer. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll we'll try, try to fix that, that because I have problems with my microphone. But thanks. thanks. Okay, thanks, Dimitris. Yeah. So, moving forward, we have actually modeled uh, the Northbound API as a data model. Uh, to, it, it's like a meta slide. We kept it to visualize how it looked like, but maybe that we we our intention is to keep it like a general introduction session for you know, and let's spark the the detailed data model discussions maybe for for further discussions due to interest of time, and, and we can yeah come back if there are necessary discussions around this topic. So, okay, so this is the example workflow which uh, we kept for visualizing the end-to-end -end flow and the orchestration, how it looks like. So if I start from the manual layer, the orchestration layer, uh, we basically onboard the CSAR packages, right, for it for every network functions using NFU. So the NSD, the network service descriptor that gets passed and then the feeding point to Eno, which is nothing but your custom resources that will be feeded into Eno through the Northbound API. And- uh, Look, I think your sharing stopped. Yeah, it was- yeah. Stop for me too. Yeah. Can you please try to reshare? Maybe there was some hiccup in the show. Network. How about now? Am I now I can it? see it. Yeah. 
okay mm -hmm. i don't know where it actually stopped so shall i but i think the I, audio I, I was fine yeah, yeah okay but i think i was only on this slide so okay let me start uh, so i was discussing about uh, the <clears throat> the end to end workflow to to visualize that how the orchestration and what all other supporting components that will uh, complete the picture of this end to end orchestration so from from top to bottom the let's start from this orchestration layer the manu uh, where we actually onboard the csar packages using nfeo right so nsd the network service descriptor will then get passed and generates the eno external resource definitions which is nothing but your custom resources which will then be feed into uh, external network operator you know uh, through the northbound api and then you know will basically triggers or um, basically use the southbound api to configure the vlans uh, in step 3 for on the fabric on the data fabric through the fabric orchestration and it basically creates or configures the vlans uh, based on the external resource definitions and assign them to the trunk ports and once the fabric orchestration that is the vlans are being created inside the data fabric you know will then create the network attachment definitions the nads in in multiple uh, terms using the obs bridge this is the example of obs uh, uh, the, so we basically create uh, the network attachment definitions and then once that has been done uh, so the gateway orchestration can like i said in the in the beginning can be done either through nfeo which is the creation of or the created vlans associated with the vrfs either through the nfeo or some scripts if, if that functionality is not there in the solution so once all this has been done from step one to step five we basically have our tenant network in place and then uh, operator can basically delegate the task to vnfm to deploy their network functions and that can be done through vnfm deploying the cnfs that will be using the tenant network that has been configured uh, using step one to five so this is the overall uh, flow the, and it, the end-to-end -end orchestration would like i mean i would like to highlight here that it's not just about you know it's it's the supporting components which we have like nfpo in the orchestration layer and then the gateway orchestration in the fabric and like I was mentioning about the proof of concept, so we identified a couple of use cases for which I would like to hand it over to Dimitros. Are you still there, Dimitros? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, but still we can hear the echo. Um, uh, sorry, I don't know why. But um, it's still better than... Mute and see if that helps. Uh, while you fix it, can I ask a question about the previous slide? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, so is this example workflow actually something you built? Is there a POC of CSAR packages working with a specific NFEO that, that works? So, yeah, so we have our Manu architects and all the internal uh, orchestration team which we, we did some technical feasibility with them and they kind of uh, like agreed that it, it is possible for for poc we haven't put the end-to-end -end part uh, but i think that's one of the requirement which we have triggered from our for our nfeo team and we have uh, Basically, during the productification, we, we have the, that requirement which will provide this feature to, to make it end-to-end -end orchestration. So 
on technical grounds it is possible but we haven't tested so far thank you okay so um, yeah daya would you like to add something yeah i just wanted to clarify from a poc perspective we would focus on um, everything inside the kubernetes um, ecosystem which would be effectively steps uh, two three and four uh, in this picture right sure i'll, I'll just uh, self-promote myself here and say that if you're looking for uh, an operator that can quickly get csr packages into kubernetes uh, check out my turn dot uh, orchestrator <laughs> uh, and i can help you with that if you like because Anyway, we'll, we'll continue talk after the presentation. Yeah, that would be really great and yeah, would be helpful to get some inputs there. Yeah. So, yeah, Dimitros, over to you for these use cases. Yeah. yeah. So, thank you, Alec. So, um, to actually put everything to the test, we, we decided to actually create a Nino POC um, to to implement everything that we, that Alok uh, have just shown. And for this in APOC, um, we will have uh, three main use cases, uh, the access mode use case, the selective trunk use case, and the transparent trunk use case. And for those use cases, we are going to handle the obvious CNI uh, and the host device CNI to actually implement everything. Um, so for the first uh, use case, we're going to create some uh, L2 service attachment. And uh, because it's an access mode use case, we're going to assign a single uh, L2 service, uh, which corresponds to one VLAN, actually. And uh, we're going to test the creation of this L2 service attachment, the updation, and the deletion. For the second um, use case, which is the selective trunk use case, um, we're going to create, uh, update, and delete an L2 service attachment. And we are going to include there uh, a range of L2 services, which means a range of VLANs. And uh, also for this one, we are going to use OVS CNI. And uh, for the transparent use case, uh, transparent trunk use case, we have uh, two branches there. We have the host device CNI and the OVS CNI branch. And in those branches, we are going to create, uh, update, and delete L2 service attachment, uh, which will be type, type trunk. And um, we are going to include there a range uh, of L2 services, which means also a range of VLANs again. So next slide, please. OK. So here I will say a few words regarding the POC setup, the Inno POC setup. So we can see here the day one. Um, uh, we have uh, four worker nodes which are arranged into pools. We have the, the blue pool and the red pool. Uh, the criteria that we actually separate nodes to different pools are the networking characteristics of the nodes. So in the red uh, node pool, we have obvious bridge, uh, bridges. And the, in the blue pool, we have a uh, virtio pool, which um, include uh, a, a range of virtio interfaces underneath. So that's why we have two different pools, because in, in, the, in the blue pool, we have the virtio pool. Uh, and the, in the red pool, we have the obvious bridges. Um, those worker VMs are connected uh, through virtio trunk interfaces uh, to the dummy fabric. Uh, which for, for POC will be an obvious uh, bridge fabric, um, but for a real deployment could be an actual a data set of fabric. And uh, to actually be able to depict the networking characteristics that our nodes uh, have to the Kubernetes API, we need to create uh, three connection points. Uh, as we can see uh, from left to right, we have a connection point which corresponds to the Virtio pool um networking object and uh, we have a connection point which uh, corresponds to the bridge transparent trunk and we have also a connection point that corresponds to the bridge data that we have in our system those um, those crs are going to be created through a kubernetes lifecycle management system or through an administrator so we register uh, that. If I can interrupt quickly, um, since we've not mentioned what L2 service attachment or connection point is, maybe just a minute if you can spend on um, what these concepts are. I think it will help the group. Um, I, I have L2 services and L2 service attachments in the in the next slides that we we have a full blown uh, example here. But 
so the connection points uh, are like uh, custom resources that Inno understands and um, visualize the actually um, represent uh, the networking characteristics of our nodes. So because we have three different networking objects, the bridge data, the bridge trunk, and the virtio pool, we need to create three different connection points for, for uh, each of those pools. So we have two pools. So we have two connection points, OVS, bridge trunk, and bridge data, which are on the red pool. And we have one connection point for the blue pool, which corresponds to the virtio pool. So uh, we register that to our Kubernetes system, and uh, we move forward. Next slide, please. So in day two, we need uh, to create a 10 L2 services and 10 subnets. So those are two services actually represent uh, one VLAN. So here we have uh, 10 L2 services. So we are going to have 10 VLANs from 10 to 20. And uh, the subnet objects represent uh, the IP address ranges that we want to associate to each of those VLANs. So um, those are custom resources that also Eno understands. So we register that to the system. And um, in the next slide, we are going to create some L2 service attachments that will bind all these together. So for now, we register that to the system and, and we move on to the, to the next slide. So here, to bind all these together, we need to create uh, four L2 service attachments. Um, with those L2 service attachments, Eno uh, will going to kick in and will uh, open the corresponding VLANs of the fabric and also will create the corresponding network attachment definitions for the project consume. So uh, in the first L2 service attachment, we can see that uh, it's VLAN type access. Uh, it's related to the obvious bridge data. It will consume only one L2 service because it's an access type to service attachment and that's villa 13 and the implementation that we are going to use the here is the obvious cni on the on the second l2 service attachment uh, is type selective trunk we are going to also use here the obvious bridge data connection point and here because it's selective trunk um, l2 service attachment we're going to use a range of l2 services from villa 10 to 14 and again we're going to uh, handle here the obvious cni for this l2 service attachment for the third one, we have a uh, VLAN type trunk. Uh, again, uh, we're going to use a ranges of L2 services from VLAN 13 to 16. Here we have a different connection point, which is uh, OVS uh, bridge trunk. And the implementation will be again OVS and I. And for the last one, uh, it's uh, VLAN type trunk again. The connection point here is different, is Vitaio pool, corresponds to the blue uh pool the blue worker pool uh the we're going to use also a range is uh, a range of l2 services from vlan 12 to 20 and the implementation here will be host device and i so we register that to kubernetes api you know watches for those events and uh, when something like this happens it will go to the to the fabric to the appropriate trunk interfaces and will open the vlans on those trunks and uh, we'll create also the network attachment definitions uh, next slide, please. So now that we have everything in place, we need pods to actually consume all those stuff. And uh, we are going to create four pods, three for the red node pool and one for the blue node pool. So for the first pod, uh, we are going to have an access mode interface for VLAN 13 at the middle of the image because we consume the network attachment definition that actually corresponds to the access of ESNI case. Um, the second pod will consume the selective of ESNI network attachment definition, and that means that we'll, we will have at the right-hand side a pod uh, that is pinned up in the red worker node pool, and we'll have a, trunk, a selective trunk interface for VLAN 10 to 14. For the third pod, we are going to use the trunk of ESNI network attachment definition, and that means that we will have one pod that actually spin ups on the worker node uh, that uh, locates in the red node pool and we'll take a transparent trunk interface from the bridge trunk. And the last pod uh, will get spin up in the blue uh, node pool, in the blue worker. And uh, we'll take a virtio interface uh, directly, a transparent trunk virtio interface directly um, will get attached to the, to, the, to the pod that actually consumes the network attachment definition, which corresponds to trunk host device and I. So this is the main idea.
Um, and with this slide, uh, we, we reached the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, please. A very quick one. Uh, these are three different clusters, am I right? No, it's the same cluster. Same cluster, okay. All right, so we have uh, the worker node pools, uh, which classifies the certain characteristics. So each uh, node pool has a set of characteristic bind to it. So in this case, the red node pool has certain characteristic versus the blue node pool, which, which is bound for host device um, using the, per, no, the, the word IO pool and has certain characteristics. So yeah, running on a same cluster. Um, Dimitris, I have a question. Mm -hmm. How do you hint the cube scheduler to deploy the pods in the workers you want? You're not using a node selector or resources no, no. so right now uh, uh it's it's uh, mandatory to have the network resource injector deployed in your uh, in your cluster okay. yeah so the network resource injector is uh, smart enough to understand that you want to get a an obvious uh interface or a virtio uh, transparent trunk interface and actually will spin up the pod uh to the appropriate worker node without for you to actually specify anything more than than only the network attachment definition. Thanks. Yeah. Um, another technical question. So uh, I don't know if you guys remember, we're part of the uh, the KNAP demo that I did a while ago. Um, I just sent a link link on uh, on the chat. Um, it's remarkable how similar <laughs> our approaches are. And we identified the same uh, kind of problems. Um, I think that, that the difference is uh, mine is just much smaller. <laughs> I worked on it on my own. You guys uh, definitely went farther, um, especially that that slide with a dotted line. You you guys went beyond the dotted line, and I uh, I stuck above it at least for POC purposes. Yeah, that initial kind of slide. Um, but one uh, technical aspect that I had an issue with was the the custom resources and dealing with uh, uh, Maltus because one of the limitations of Maltus CNI and CNI generally, it depends on which CNI plugin exactly, is that um, you can't do day two changes or after the, the pod has been already set. That is, uh, if you change the Maltus annotations, right, you'll, you'll, you'll want to uh, recreate the pod. <laughs> Recreate right. all pods to to make sure that they reconnect to the new service. So you have a bit of a chicken and an egg problem, and and you have to actually deploy things in certain orders. Did you guys hit this problem, and how did you solve it? I mean, um, we don't solve it. Actually, we we assume that we have everything in place through Ino. So we create the VLANs on the fabric uh, through Ino and the network attachment definition. And uh, and the pods uh, will just consume those network attachment definition. If we want to update those network attachment definition, then we need to bring down the pods and and create the new ones. We don't have any hot plugin of interfaces. Yeah, so it's it's more of a rolling update use case, right? So you yeah. you change or you update your configurations for a particular VLAN or if you change certain VLAN IDs or extend your network, then you basically bring up your version two network service, which will then deploy or basically makes and makes before break. And then basically does the, the, does the transition from version one to version two. So, yeah. So yes, yeah, so if, if you're interested, the way I solved it was, um, uh, which is not necessarily a great solution. Definitely other people have given uh, some other ideas, but uh, one solution uh, that I did was actually to monitor kind of that relationship between uh, certain Kubernetes resources that have that annotation. So it would be deployments, replica mm -hmm. sets, and pods, uh, and to see the annotations that they have there, and then you know which custom resources they actually connect to. So if you detect a change in the if the operator detects a change in the, in the custom resource, it will know to uh, restart those deployments. You have to do a little bit of trickery, right? Because Kubernetes doesn't have a 
a restart API, right? It, it would restart if there's a certain change uh, to the resource. So you can update its version, for example, its ID. Yeah, uh, from what I understand, you just uh, uh, watching for events uh, of uh, of updation of the of the custom resource, and if that happens, then you spin up again the pods, something like that. Yeah. Right. Right. I I think the reason it's so awkward is that well, it assumes that users would only use a deployment or a replica set, you know, the built-in controllers, mm -hmm. but, you know, there are daemon sets, there's um, uh, uh, stateful sets. These are built-in controllers part of Kubelet, but if somebody extends with something new, your, your operator wouldn't know about them. It's, it's not the best solution. There's, there's an issue here, I think, in Kubernetes that we're all aware of that handling this by annotations might not be the best way, right? But this is how Multis works. Uh, it, it's weird, right? Annotations seem like this is metadata. This is not, but then we're dealing with something really intrinsic in terms of connectivity. Um, anyway, it's it's exactly this kind of topic. This might bleed us into uh, the next item on the agenda or uh, what's available on the agenda today to talk about networking orchestration, right? The, these are exactly the topics that I think we all want to talk about. How are we actually solving these things? at a low level, at a high level. Uh, and I, I just want to thank you for this work too. I think this this adds a lot to the discussion and it's really wonderful. So thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Tal. And, and just to add, uh, we actually evaluated KNAB in, in the beginning, like what all the different uh, approaches which is available in the community. And there is one from Red Hat as well, which is cluster network operator, if I'm remembering correctly. But I think th the bottom line is that they are exclusively for meant for the internal Kubernetes ecosystem or handling the uh, custom resources. And we, we don't have as such uh, this external or the second facade, which basically does the data fabric orchestration, right? So, so we kind of stretch it a bit and ex like you said, extend it a bit, that idea and to bring uh, to bring the end-to-end -end orchestration going towards the switch level or, or on a fabric level, and then uh, try to automate that that area. That it, yeah. So uh, it's it's we can say it's a bit of an extension to what we have in yeah, in projects like KNAP and cluster network operator. But yeah, that we actually evaluated before and. Yeah, start starting up with this effort. So um, I, I don't want to take too much time here, but I, I, I guess another aspect uh, challenge that I think uh, comes out of this POC is how do you, you know, you created custom resources for these specific technologies, right? L2 attachment. Mm -hmm. um, and the challenge in Kubernetes is that all these kind of can look like one shots, right? So for a very specific use case, you would create a custom resource with its own operator. That works, of course, but um, uh, the challenge is really how do we unite all these different custom resources that might be contributed by the community into some kind of solution that really could be more generic, right? If you can install these plugins in a generic way or, um, yeah, how do we move beyond um, specific bespoke solutions to to a really uh, a general solution? I, I think that's one of the the tasks I see for the networking orchestration task force uh, to think about this problem and and provide solutions. Hal, yes, uh, and I, I was sorry, just one 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 thing. Like I was thinking about this, and and there is there is this uh, way how the CSI interface works and how the CSI selects the let's say the storage implementation to use and I think maybe we could use something like that to select the correct backend plugin. But I totally agree that 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 we shouldn't have any technology specific in the North and the API of 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 this. And also another thing what is what is my worry is that we somehow need to separate uh, the let's say network administration tasks from the network consuming tasks. 
So the administration as in the, the creation of these networks and then the deployment or yeah, uh, the cre creation of the networks, like assignments of, I and, don't know, whatever, VLANs or, right. you know, anything. And that, with... that we have a, like a very thin borderline between the two and we kind of try to keep it decoupled in, in the form of packages. So we will be, so we have this VNFD packages in, in, in terms of the NFEO and then that will be specifically or exclusively for, for our network functions, right? And that will hold only the, the deployments of your network functions and then the networks or the, yeah, the external networks that has been created earlier upon through, let's say the NSTs and basically that's the administration part which you were pointing to and that's how we kind of uh, kept the borderline between the two and try to have their own life cycle that. okay that sounds good and is there any is there also like uh, uh, interoperability of the of the VNFD in a sense that if you run it on another Kubernetes cluster, which uses sure. it, like something as an OVS, OVS bridge, then the same thing yeah, will work. Should, yeah, it, it should support interoperability and so the portability that it could run on different clusters and yeah, so on. Uh, yeah, that was all from our side about the small introduction of Eno and Hello, uh, just, you. Yeah. I just just have a question regarding um, yes, the process you. to install Eno is just straightforward. Do you, do you need any specific requirement or any specific Kubernetes version or just mm. run the, the YAML not, and that's it? Not in general, no. With we don't have any dependencies to on which Kubernetes version. So it should, ideally it should work on any Kubernetes version or even on the commercial deployments or the flavors of, of the variants of cluster. Yeah. So no okay. specific requirements on, on that level. Yeah. Got it. Thanks. Yeah, we, we can we can think you know as an application that you can actually deploy it uh, in one click, and you have then network automation on your cluster. Uh, what what about step five shown here in this diagram? I heard you mention that you haven't got to it around to it yet. But any thoughts on how it might work? Do you plan to develop some? generic plugin, something that will can do net confiang or something like that, or how do you see that evolving? Yeah, so Daya, would you like to take that question? Or... Um, yeah, sure. So we have been pondering about using, um, building something like an open config uh, with either gRPC or netconf that can talk to different devices um, for this gateway configuration. Um, as far as you know, it's maybe Alok, you can go back to the fabric plugin uh, uh, slide. Sure. Yeah. As far as you know, itself is uh, concerned, though, um, we have not found any adequate sort of API which can work at a fabric level. Um, you know, something like Neutron, or if there's uh, a vendor fabric, um, there's we haven't seen uh, an open source um, standardized fabric API as such. Um, so that's where the gap is of, uh, you know, uh, although the southbound from such a service could be open config, which is a very device configuration specific interface. Um, there's no standardized, uh, at least to our knowledge, fabric um, API, uh, which could which could basically help build that layer. And yeah, thank you. I, I mean, I'm, I'm aware of the issue. But was wondering if you have a solution. Thank We're you. coming top of the hour. Um, yeah. um, I want to make sure that we have enough time for anything else. Yeah. And what, one of the actions going forward um, related to several of the comments, 
there's multiple projects um, that are out there that are trying to solve this. So one thing that could happen would be an effort to list all of those and then potentially map out the differences so that people can see here's what this offers and here's the other thing. And then a potentially a separate um, action would be to, um, to analyze the projects to see what are, parts are they trying to solve. We're kind of talking about it here, but there's potentially parts that could be broken out and then we bring those forward. Like we're talking about these APIs right now. And I know um, some of these items are have been discussed for um, quite a while over in like cluster API. So how are they going to handle provisioning the network fabric if you're at a point where you're doing bare metal provisioning? And I, I know those discussions are there because I was in those uh, more than a year ago. Um, that's only one group though within the Kubernetes ecosystem. But if, if we've look at all these projects and then can split out and point out the problems that each of the different parts are uh, trying to solve, then ideally we can go and reach out to the um, some of the Kubernetes groups and see if there's if interest in getting involved in those areas as well. But we need a list of, of the projects and what they're providing and what they're trying to solve. Um, before other people can get involved with these projects like Eno or um, KNAP or any of them, um, and then mapping them. Uh, so I think that's exactly one of the uh, goals of the task force, <laughs> at least as I see it, to do that work of comparison. Absolutely. And, and one of the big things, and we've already talked about this, Tal, is, is splitting um, what are the needs and um, that we're having and what's missing versus potential implementation so that, and we can work backwards. It's fine, right? Like Eno and, and some of these things already are, uh, have implementations, of course, but there was something driving it. So we want to bring that up to the top is what's going to be desired, especially in the, if we dive in the Kubernetes community and get more people involved. They're going to want to, talk about the general driving needs versus the implementation um, sh showing that. They'll first want to hear all about the needs. So uh, we are almost at the top of the hour, but um, the agenda item about the update about the task force, I'll do it in one sentence. Uh, please continue to the CNF uh, work group meeting that is just after this because the decision has been basically to move the task force to the CNF work group governance. So uh, uh, the update will happen there, I guess, in the next meeting. Well, thanks, Tal. And the last thing um, for people that are interested, there is currently a self-nomination period for leaders for the Cloud Native Network Function Working Group leadership. And there's a link to it in the meeting docs. Um, and so if you're interested to see who's running for leadership or are interested in getting more involved, there's more details uh, in the link in the docs uh, to the mailing list. With that, um, the CNF working group will be starting in about two minutes here. So unless anybody has anything else they'd like to add today, I'd say thank you all for coming and then we can either go about our days or switch over to the next meeting. Thank you all for listening in and yeah, giving us an opportunity to present it here in the community. Yeah, and thank you for presenting today. I thought it was really insightful. Thank you. All right, thanks. Talk to everyone later, bye. Bye.